I'm David Gauntlet. Thank you for coming along to this. Um, how many of you are design product students? Almost all of you, okay, except for some extra guests. So that's nice. Hello to guests. Hello to design product students. Um, as it happens, I'm the external examiner for information experience design at World College of Art. That's a course which you chose not to do because you chose to do design products instead. Um, Charlotte from them is here. Uh, anybody else from IED? Oh, right, okay, some of you too. Okay, good. That's nice to see. Okay, um, you don't need to be any of these things, anybody else, but it's nice to see all of you. Um, so I was invited here to do a talk about uh, basically Bob, who's interviewing now, so he's not here at this moment. He told me to talk about the kind of stuff that I do and the kind of things I'm interested in for like two thirds or so, or three quarters. And at the end bit, I have to discuss Platform 22, which to some of you sounds like an 80s band, and to some of the rest of you, hopefully, uh, you know what Platform 22 is, which you've invited me to talk about, or which we will talk about together. You know what I mean? Does this make sense to you? Okay, good. Platform 22 is a strange political motion thing sent to me, and I thought sent to everybody else who's talking as part of this series, but it turns out there's been other platforms. They've received platforms 19 and 17 and maybe 12 even, all those ones. And I've got 22 for some reason, so uh, we'll be talking about that. I'll show you what it is. Those of you who haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, we'll see this a little bit later on. Um, so I called it this, Making Us Connecting, Designing Experiences and Creative Collaboration, because that was three things that I thought you might like me to talk about, hopefully. Um, so that's me. Uh, that's me on Twitter. I don't know if we have a hashtag for this. I think we don't. But if you'd like to tweet me uh, with that, and maybe you could inaugurate a hashtag somehow, if you're using Twitter. I know Twitter seems very 2008 now, but I still like Twitter. Um, and there's my website there. Look, this is a quick shot of like, if you want to hear more stuff about this kind of stuff, then there's like stuff, okay? So that's where the stuff lives, at davidgauntlet.com. But you don't know if you want to know about the stuff yet, because I haven't talked about it yet, so now we'll talk about it. The stuff I'm going to talk about, uh, I divided up like this. So there's some stuff about making is connecting. Let's wish round. Look, making is connecting. I'll talk about that briefly. Triggers. I'm going to explain all of this when we do it. This is the, this is the orientation. This is just starting out so you can find your, your way along the path. Uh, platforms for creativity. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Conversations. Essentially, the long tail. Still an interesting thing. Collaborations. There's a bunch of things I could talk about there, which uh, for in particular, I've collaborated with Lego for 11 years now on various different things. So you might like that bit. And so I might speed through some earlier bits to get to that bit, because I think that's a bit you might like. Yeah. And Platform 22, that's up there. Those of you who don't know what Platform 22 is, it's up there. You're not going to see the detail now, though. Um, what is Platform 22? I could have started a whole internet meme about it, but I didn't because it wouldn't be of interest to anybody, unfortunately. Um, so overall, what is this whole thing about? Um, it's about because I did this and it's what, so it's got these bits. And I think, oh, I need to tell you what the whole thing's about. So then you get your head around that. That's just stuff falling over. The power of everyday creativity, the role of designers within that, um, and how we can make things better. I'm not a product designer. Uh, presumably, on an MA called Design Products, you're probably all quite oriented towards product design. Um, I do, in a sense, design experiences for people to be a part of through which they may design products or design other stuff, or they may not really be designing anything at all, but they're just thinking through the answers to things or mapping out their experiences or trying to make connections between bu different bunches of stuff. So I'm more familiar with designing experiences than I am with designing actual things, but hopefully. I, I like people making things, so I've got that. So hopefully you can put all together all the useful bits of that to make something useful. Um, so I did a book in 2011 called Making is Connecting, um, I've done another book since then, but Making is Connecting is still my favourite book that I wrote. <laughs> that sounds like I cherish and love all of my books. Um, for one thing, it's got the best title. I can say that. I'm not making any claims about the content of the book, but it's Making is Connecting seems like a good title to me, so I was pleased with that. Um, look, there it is over there. Um, uh, so I'm doing a second edition this year as well. Uh, and it was meant to be about linking together different kinds of creativity and the value of that creativity for people, whether it was online stuff that people were doing or offline stuff that people were doing, or those things meshed together, which often seem to be the most powerful kind of thing, as you can see from that subtitle. Um, 
The reason why I say making is connecting is for three reasons. So I'll do these bits of making is connecting first of all. Um, I say making is connecting first of all because when we put together ideas or stuff to make something new, making is connecting because when we are creative, when we make things, we put together ideas and stuff to make something new. That's just the putting things together bit. But then secondly, making is connecting because there's always inevitably or almost inevitably, a social dimension to any act of creativity. We like to be able to share things with other people. It is possible to be somebody who sits on the top of a mountain making cuckoo clocks and never talking to anybody else, but most normally, there's always a social kind of dimension to creativity where we show it or share it to other people and have some kind of interaction around the thing we've made. So that's a powerful bit of it, I think. But the third bit, which I think is even more powerful, is the fact that Making is connecting because when we make things, when we feel more connected to the world through participating, not just being a consumer, but being a maker of stuff in the world, stuff which we shape according to our own preferences and tastes, and we make things that we want to make because of personal, the personal drive to make things. I think that's really powerful. It means that if pe more people are making, basically, then more people feel embedded in the world, participating in the world, and sort of empowered in the world, which I think is a vital thing for us as a planet, to, to leap to the biggest possible scale. I think it's vitally important that people feel engaged and creative in their everyday lives, because without that, well then you essentially don't have a very healthy society. So within Making is Connecting, as I said, I'll just give you a few bits from this. Um, one bit I liked was uh, looking at creativity across time. There seemed to be a thing during the, sort of the early 2000s at least, where it was almost like creativity had suddenly been invented by the World Wide Web or by the internet and the connections that people were making there. And there were certain texts that came out that made it almost sound like creativity had never happened before. And then, thank God, the internet came along and connected everybody up and poof, creativity took off. Um, I, I'm, I'm not actually hostile to those kind of ideas, but I thought it was more interesting to see creativity as part of a continuum which goes across time, because of course people have been creative within their lives for many, many, many tens of thousands of years. That's what people do. It's what people like to do. You could say there was a kind of lull towards the end of the 20th century where human beings in Western societies and other places got used to the idea that the way we spend our time is to sit on some chairs facing a particular other bit of furniture in a different corner, and that's what we do for four or five hours a day. Um, so then it was nice when the internet came along and people, the popular use of the web and social media, as we call it now, um, with people making and doing stuff there, that we seem to be moving away from that kind of television mode where people sit and receive stuff sent to them made by professionals to a mode where people are much more making and sharing stuff between each other. Um, I work in a media and communications kind of department um, where you can find no end of people, not only in my department, but in many departments around the country, uh, who like to talk about the, the downsides of all of this, the way in which the internet now gives the state much greater capacity for surveillance, which is true, and the ways in which you can see all the creative stuff that people make online as being basically their like, exploited labor creating value, which is extracted by Google et al, who make all the money from it. There's an argument to be made there too. Um, I don't sit within that whole way of talking about things. I sit in a different way of talking about things. Um, because that, that bit I was just talking about there in particular, that's like the economic lens. And if you use that particular economic lens, that is true. That is where the economic value sort of ends up. If you're looking at um, videos that people put freely on YouTube, for example. But I think the interesting thing about people freely putting their videos on YouTube, where they've made some little song or a comedy sketch or some instructions on how to make a thing or how to repair a thing, any of that stuff, they weren't doing it for money reasons. They were doing it for other reasons. They were doing it because they had something that they wanted to communicate with other people or they wanted to make them smile or laugh, something that maybe they wanted to show to one or two friends and they're just happy if anybody else sees it. They're not doing it for economic reasons. So the economic critique may add up in certain ways, but it ignores the fact that people are making and sharing stuff for other reasons, personal reasons, passion-driven kind of reasons, um, which I think is nice and is interesting and which shouldn't be crushed under the wheels of economic analysis. Because you can actually say that both things are happening. It is true that, you know, the economic wealth primarily ends up in the pockets of Google, etc. Nevertheless, there is value, social, creative kind of value, created by people who are just making and sharing stuff online and that's what they like to do and it inspires them to do more of it. Um, so it's good for them. Going back to that point about going back in time then, uh, Rosika Parker, I liked this when I looked at um, The Subversive Stitch by Rosika Parker, who's a kind of 1970s feminist and she wrote a book called The Subversive Stitch. Um, and she talks about 
clearly this is not about electronic communications in any, of any sort. This is about embroidery. She talks about embroidery in this particular case as both a, a marker of femininity on the one hand, so it's a thing that women did in the past. She's talking about 17th, 18th century women doing embroidery. It was a marker of femininity, yes, but also she calls it a weapon of resistance to the constraints associated with that idea of femininity so that women could kind of take time to carve out a space to do their own thing, create a self-initiated project, essentially, which they started up themselves, and which they they're sort of allowed time to do that, because it's known that that's what they're doing, so they can be doing that. And so it's space away from all of the other stuff in their lives where they can just be focused on that, and take it through to completion. Um, carve out a, pace, a place for personal thought and self-expression, as she says there. And then you've got this quote here, right? Um, I'll read it out what it says here first. The experience of embroidering and the embroidery affirms the self as a being with agency, acceptability, and potency. The embroiderer sees a positive reflection of herself in her work, and importantly, in the reception of her work by others. And then if you swizz that around so you apply it to any other kind of activity, say on social media, say if you take something quite ordinary like blogging, then if you turn it into blogging, you've got the experience of uh, blogging and the blog affirms the self as a being with agency, acceptability, and potency. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, the blogger sees a positive reflection of themselves in their work and, importantly, in the reception of their work by others. That is true. That is blogging. That is why people like to do blogging. That's why people continue to do blogging, even when in an age where people start going, oh, blog's dead, etc. Um, it's the reason why we make and share lots of things online, I think. There's that sense of self, the sort of powerful self that's made something, and other people see the thing you've made, and they like it, hopefully. If they don't, you essentially don't want to hear from them. But... Uh, if they do like it, or some number of people like it, that feels good. Um, and that sort of positive reflection in yourself, in A, in the fact that you made it yourself, and B, in the reception of that work by other people, I think that is key. Um, and that was about embroidery, not about social media. Um, that's John Ruskin, nine, uh, Victorian eminent art critic kind of guy, uh, who in the early part of his career was quite establishment, you probably know about John Ruskin, um, and then went increasingly bonkers and alienated from the art world uh, because he had his own particular individualistic take on the power of making, and he thought the power of making should be important for everybody, which put him at odds with the sort of elitist art world at the time. Um, so just to give one example of that, John Ruskin gets very excited about um, the gargoyles on medieval cathedrals. You've seen gargoyles and medieval cathedrals. Um, in art world terms, well, then they're kind of ugly, unfinished, not the kind of thing that's normally celebrated in the art world even then. Um, but John Ruskin loved them, though I love him for loving them, because he liked them because within them you can see the spirit of an individual maker. These were essentially made by people who were working on what is the corporate project of making a cathedral. Um, and within that work, they carved out the space to do their own personal little bit which is just based on their own idea, their own design, doing the thing that they want to do, um, driven by personal passion. Um, he, calls, he calls it a celebration of humanity's imperfections. It's not dependent on anyone's permission, really. They were, it was okay for them to do this, but they didn't have to pass designs past anybody else or get a kind of thumbs up from anybody else. So it's personal passion-driven thing. Um, and I like a celebration of humanity's imperfections. And then if you apply that kind of model to, say, YouTube, um, well, then, again, you've got unfinished, sometimes a bit ugly, sometimes a bit baffling kind of stuff, which doesn't look like conventional television, but is interesting and powerful for those people who it speaks to because, because of its unfinished nature. It's just the spirit of a, a person that wants to communicate something in the world. It's got something they want to express, and they're going to express it anyway, regardless of whether it lines up with the most finely finished models of how you ought to be doing things. So it's that personal passion to make things. Uh, which Ruskin thought was vital for a society, vital for its health, and I think that's right, um, and inspired William Morris. You know about William Morris probably, and I'll zhwish forward here. The other person who's a key figure in Making is Connecting, uh, again, digging up people from the past to make them relevant to today's, in particular, digital sharing kind of culture, is Ivan Illich. So Ivan Illich was a sort of 1970s, or popular in the 1970s, uh, philosopher guy, who was famous for a book called Deschooling Society. Um, after that one, he did a book called Tools for Conviviality. And within that, he says many interesting things, but this is just one interesting thing. Um, he says, people need not only to obtain things, so it's not just about things, so note that, design product students. Uh, they need, above all, the freedom to make the things among which they can live, to give shape to them according to their own tastes, 
and to put them to use in caring for and about others. So it's about being able to create, create your own environment, create your own things, uh, which are of service to you, which maybe communicate something of yourself and your passions and your likes uh, within the world in which you live. Um, and again, I think that's very potent in terms of media. I come from a kind of media background. Um, very potent in terms of media because if it's about people making things that communicate something of themselves, which shape, uh, made according to their own tastes and so on, that's much, much more powerful and exciting than any of the s s stuff you can talk about, television, cinema, big stuff made by professionals away over there. I like stuff made by ordinary people, not by the professionals over there. With apologies to those of you who are training to be the professionals over there. But I think it's a bit different in media to in other things, perhaps. Um, so that was that. And then just the little bird in the making is connecting bit. The little bird is there to remind me um, that it's not just, I always remember the phrase goes, it's not just, and I have to remember what my point is about the little bird. It's not just, um, it, <laughs> sorry, the point of my little bird is to remind me that um, when you come from a context like I come from, which is media communication studies, right, well then, you work with people who are working on things like regulations for Ofcom and they're talking about the future of the BBC and all these big corporate kind of things. And then here I am studying things like um, a girl who's made a video about a scarf and somebody who's made a funny little video and somebody who's managed to compose a song which they wanted to share with two or three other people and it went viral to like 300 people. Small numbers, insignificant sounding stuff if you come from that kind of context. I think it's really important, powerful stuff, because where you've got people making things just because it's what they want to do, not because they're doing it for qualification, not because they're doing it for money, not because they're doing it because somebody else told them they got to do it for some other weird reason, but because it's just what they want to do. I think that's a really powerful driver of uh, potentially political movement within a society and of engagement and people feeling alive within the places where they live, which is very important, I think. Um, that's what the pretty little bird is doing up the tree, anyway. Um, so that was the bit about making us connecting, and so in that, that was a, a book, and it, within that book I managed to sum up some of those things that I was interested in. And so then beyond that, well then, I've done other things and made connections with other things. The uh, more recent thing I've been thinking about, or one thing I've been thinking about, is this idea of triggers. So media, or environments, or things, or events as triggers for experiences and for making things happen, which is kind of borrowed from a uh, Brian Eno quote, which itself is borrowed from something that Roy Ascot said when Roy Ascot taught Brian Eno at Ipswich College of Art. Um, when they talked about art as a trigger for experiences and a trigger for making things happen. Um, and I think that you can think about media and things, even more broadly than art, just anything that you might be designing, in that sense as a trigger for causing things to happen in the world, a trigger for people being inspired or having conversations with other people or wanting to make other things. I think that's a powerful way of thinking about it. Um, I had a few examples about this and then I thought that's going to be too many examples so I killed them all off except for this one because this is my favourite one. Um, this is in Belgium, right? I was on holiday in a strange corner of Belgium. Belgium isn't so big that you can be too lost in Belgium but I was in like the most empty corner of Belgium. Um, but I saw a leaflet for a place called Klankenbos, which I obviously liked because it sounded like a Kraftwerk album, basically. But um, I just happened to see this leaflet and thought, Klankenbos sounds cool, let's go and see it. Um, so I went with my kids and it was very nice because it was a sculpture park. You've seen sculpture parks before, but it was a sculpture park for sound art. So essentially you walk through a forest and every so often you come across some thing that probably makes some kind of sound or engages with sound in some kind of way, as well as often being an interesting kind of object. So that was really nice. For one thing, it's just like a nice walk, <laughs> interspersed with interesting, thought-provoking things. Um, it was unusual and different. I, I really liked it. This is the best bit, I thought, because you kind of come into a clearing, and in the middle of, it's not a big clearing, but a sort of clearing, in the middle of this clearing, on a slight tomb, is this glass box. So you think, what's that? Um, and it doesn't really look like something that's going to make a sound. And you can't get into the glass box. If you just go up to the glass box and you can't see this bit, or you don't note that bit, then it's just a glass box. But if you come over here, that steps down into a tunnel. I don't know if your eyes can make sense of this, but that steps down into an underground passage, which takes you a few metres along, and then you can come up inside the box. So it's a way of entering the box. Um, and inside the box, it's a completely soundproof box. 
so you can't hear anything. So the experience of sound which you get in this forest when you're inside the box is the experience of silence, which is very interesting in an environment where normally there's quite a lot of low-level ambient sound going on, which probably you don't think too much about. You do think about it when you can't hear it. Um, so I thought that was really nice. Uh, and as, as, a, as a trigger for thought, at least, it, it kind of really stuck with me. And so, you know, this, in a sense, this could be any artwork that I happen to encounter if it was a really good striking one. But I really like this one. It really stuck with me for some reason and has been a trigger for other thoughts for me. Um, so then, related to that and borrowing some of those words, this is a bit which I wrote in the more recent book that I did, which was called Making Media Studies, um, where, again, with making is connecting, I kind of made it sound like you didn't need to read the book because you could just look at the three words and it kind of gave you the basic idea. Uh, with this one, I'm saying you don't need to read the whole book because you can just look at this because this was the best bit. And so it's like on page 15 and I put a box around it so that you could tell it was important. Um, <laughs> so again, I, I shouldn't shoot whole books in the foot in this way, but there you go. Um, so this one says, this is about how we think about media. Um, but I think of me, if you're thinking, why is he talking about media? We're not here to talk about media. But I think of media in the extreme plural, where media is the plural word for medium, obviously. And a medium can be anything. It can be a stick. It can be charcoal. It can be television, radio, computers, things with screens. But it can be anything at all. Um, so we've got this. We should look at media not as channels, which is common or for communicating messages, not as things, but think of them as triggers for experiences of making things happen. That's that bit. They can be places of conversation, exchange, and transformation. So three things. Conversation, people exchanging ideas. Exchange, where I'm kind of using the word exchange instead of the more uh, popular word share, which has been ruined by Mark Zuckerberg talking nauseatingly about people sharing things, uh, where actually what he means is putting things on Facebook, which isn't quite the same, I think, as the actual human act of sharing, which I used to know before Facebook was invented. Um, where I thought it was about sort of giving something of yourself, having a sort of shared experience within your mind and the mind of another person as you share a thing. That's the sort of nice version of sharing, which is not exactly the same as just sticking a link to a funny article on Facebook or something, is it? Um, so maybe we have to call it exchange now, just to avoid using the word share, even though the word share is probably nicer, but exchange is all right. And then transformation, as in actually changing people through doing these things which must be the whole point of any of the things that you do, where you're hoping there's going to be some kind of change in the world. Um, in terms of media, there's so much of it. Media in the world means a fantastically messy set of networks filled with millions of sparks, some igniting new meanings, ideas, and passions, and some just fading away. So it's kind of saying that there's so much stuff in the world now, certain random bits might be really important and might fire off all kinds of exciting new potentials, but we don't normally know which ones those ones are going to be. And then there's like millions of other ones as well. And we don't have to worry about all of them because there's too many of them these days. Um, but the really powerful ones are the ones that do ignite new meanings, ideas, and passions. You don't have to worry about the other ones. Um, so that was that bit, which was about the triggers. Then uh, another thing I think about these days is platforms for creativity, which is this is the bit that's kind of about designing environments because it's about the idea of setting up situations in which people can be creative. So you're probably familiar with the word platforms as that word which describes things like YouTube, Facebook, uh, other kind of social media places, Instagram, where people come together to share things electronically. I'm taking it much broader than that to be essentially anything, which can be big or small, um, and can be online or offline or both, uh, where people are, receive some kind of invitation to come in and do a thing. And it's the invitation in particular is central to the platform, I think. So this, for example, is uh, a library space thing in Gouda, which they invited me along to because they'd read Making is Connecting and they thought it was about that, so that's good. Um, this is their little diagram for it. I've added on the yellow stuff. But it's called Chocolate Factory in Gouda. Gouda, the home of the popular yellow cheese. You know it's round, it's yellow, it's a cheese. That one, Gouda. Um, and within a single space, which used to be a chocolate factory, hence the name, they brought together the city library, uh, the regional archive, which is kind of like family records and all that stuff, a restaurant, a printing workshop, a uh, youth workshop, a media workshop and workspaces, all in one place. In a sense, that's not too unusual because you can probably think of uh, you know, buildings in cities that you know of where they've also brought together several things in one space, including the library. Um, but they seem to have them especially integrated in this one. It was very nice. And one thing that stuck in my mind that they told me about it was that they have regular meetings to talk about their cultural program 
and each of these different partners has a voice. Uh, and one of those partners is the restaurant, and the restaurant has exactly as much voice as any of the other parts. So it's really sort of integrated in that way. They're all participating in creating this cultural program together. Another nice thing was when the library closed, because um, the library had to close to then move into this new building, um, then there was going to be a period of about a week where the old library was closed and the new library hadn't opened yet. And so what do you do about that? Also, you've got a ton of books. You've got to get them from there to there. So what they did was they invited all of the community to come in and everybody could take away some books. So everybody did that. So they all took away the books. And then a week later, they were all invited to bring the books back. So they brought the books back to the new library. And so by this means, you get all of the books from that place to that place, whilst also engaging people with the idea that the library is changing and all of that stuff and bringing them into the new building. So that was really neat um, and seemed to work. And people mostly didn't nick the books, which is one of the things that people think of in, when they hear this story. But they're, they're nice people in Gouda. They've got yellow cheese. They don't need to steal books. Um, so th that was really nice. seemed to embody a sort of holistic, creative kind of culture. The idea was that uh, a library, in this new way of thinking about it, is not a repository of expertise from the past. People have learned stuff and written it down in books and put it in a library. The idea is that the library is a platform for people to be creative within, within a community. People to come together, make stuff, and you can, for one thing, the library is a kind of showcase for that, and everybody can see what everybody else is doing uh, in a positive sharing kind of way. Um, so I like that one. Then there's. Uh, other examples, that's the Chicago library system is also embracing this idea of libraries and maker spaces and so on. Um, Minecraft, say, is a creative platform where people can come together and do that kind of stuff. Um, that's uh, talking about those kind of things in Lego. How do you make one of these kind of platforms work? I've made a few rules. Um, I've sort of written a list of principles for why this should be, and these are the, some of the best ones. Um, Embrace that thing that it's what people want to do already. So if there's people in society who want to be creating, which of course there are, many people, in a sense I think everybody, at some point had that need or that urge, um, then you should embrace that, people's natural propensity, rather than trying to make them do other things. Some of the items on this list come from the fact that I worked with the BBC on a virtual world thing that they were creating for children. And essentially it was like, they thought, oh, we're brilliant. We've created this amazing virtual world. It kind of seemed like the BBC had created a 3D virtual world for children so they could go, go, to, yeah, so they could go to the Cannes Media Festival and tell other media professionals that they created a virtual world for children rather than actually being that bothered about the actual children uh, who are mere pawns in this game. Um, and, and so they'd sort of designed this whole kind of thing and the idea was that children would sort of buy into this BBC created world and would do things that the BBC hoped that they would do within this world. And it was kind of going against the grain of what kids actually wanted to be doing on a thing like this. So it was OK, but it didn't really take off. Something like Minecraft totally takes off because it enables kids to do whatever they want to do or anybody else to do whatever they fancy doing um, without trying to force them into some kind of particular premeditated kind of thing, which was the mistake they made there, I think. Uh, one example of one that works is the Global Cardboard Challenge. You may know of this. It's a thing that takes place around the world now, um, inspired by a video called Kane's Arcade, which went viral, which I don't think I've got the time to tell you the story of now. And anyway, it makes me cry. So if you want to know what video makes me cry, you can look up the Kane's Arcade video. Um, just put Kane's Arcade into Google. It's the story of a nine-year-old boy who made an arcade out of cardboard. There we go. See, I managed to tell you that much without crying. Um, it's nice. Uh, <laughs> and because that video went viral, they put a little link at the end. So I'm not telling you about the video, but I'm telling you what they put at the end, which was a little link saying if you want to donate to Kane's College Fund, he was a nine-year-old boy who made an arcade out of cardboard, then you can. Um, and people loved the video so much that they immediately raised like five million dollars in the space of about ten days, which was highly unexpected. Um, and so then. In a sense, you've got the question of, oh God, what do I do with $5 million? I hadn't really expected getting that, just because I made a video that went viral on YouTube. Um, and so they set up an educational foundation called the Imagination Foundation, which now runs a thing called the Global Cardboard Challenge on a date that celebrates the thing that Cain did and gets everybody else making a thing in cardboard. The point about this is, um, it's just a thing that invites people to make something out of cardboard on a day. You could say, that's not an idea. That doesn't sound like anything. We could all make a thing out of cardboard in our kitchens this evening. Um, because of the people who you are, maybe you will actually do that. Most people don't do that. The thing about why this is successful, I guess, is because it just contains an invitation to do a thing that other people are doing. 
So anybody can make something out of cardboard and put some pictures of it online if they want to, but they don't. The thing that means that on this day they do is because they're being invited to take part in some kind of global celebration of creativity and people like that idea and they like being able to see what other people have done. And so because of that, then it becomes a thing. So a thing that essentially sounds like not an idea becomes a big global phenomenon. Because of the nature of the invitation, the way in which you can understand what it is, it connects with something quite emotional and, and heartwarming. And for that reason, manages to take off, I think. Um, and also a simple explanation of how this takes off comes from, again, this feeds back to my work with Lego, where within Lego, they have an idea which I think has its origins with Mitch Resnick at MIT. Mitch Resnick has also worked with Lego, and he invented Scratch, the programming language you might know about, and he helped them work on Lego Mindstorms, which is the Lego robotics system. Um, he talks about experiences which have a low floor, high ceiling, and wide walls. What does this mean? The low floor means it's really easy to step into, so it's an experience where it's just like kind of obvious what you can do with it, it's straightforward. So for example, Lego, I give you a bunch of Lego, it's quite easy to just go click, 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 you start doing things. Very low floor for stepping into it. Um, but then it's got a high ceiling because you could then take that to any level of complexity, so you can quite quickly be making, or if you've got enough bricks at least, very complex things, you could be making the most complicated uh, you know, spaceships, rockets, or architecture, or whatever. But there's also wide walls, which means you don't need to be making spaceships, rockets, or architecture. You could be making forests, or rabbits, or parrots, or any other noun that I could put into this sentence. Chairs, donuts, whatever, Wellington boots, out of Lego, because you can make anything out of Lego. So it's got that wide walls. So easy to step into, complex, endless variety. That is low floor, high ceiling, wide walls. And that seems to be a good model to follow if you're trying to set up an experience which people can step into easily but then engage with in different ways. So you can apply it to lots of different things, obviously. I also say support storytelling. People love to share stories uh, where story can mean anything, just basically a, a, the tale of an experience of something that happened to me or the experience of something that happened to somebody else. Um, that's a popular form of story that we all like to share. Um, exchange. So I show something to you, you show something to me. I'm like, oh, you made that thing, I like that thing, but I like that thing that you did with that, and you like the thing that I did with that, and we connect through this process of exchanging ideas and experiences. Um, and recognition, which is the bit where we, um, I found when I looked in Making is Connecting, I looked at lots of studies that had uh, studied why people like to make things in the online world, and other kinds of studies, because they're never the same people, but other people had also studied why people like to make things in the offline world, like studies of the craft movement and so on, and what they get out of it. And it's all kind of quite predictable stuff about why they, the, you know, the, the feeling of satisfaction in making a thing yourself, the happiness with being part of a community who also like to make those things. But then the other key thing that stood out was about recognition, which is that people actually do like it, especially when somebody says, oh, I really like that thing that you did kind of thing, or essentially, I respect what you did there, that's really good, or that thing that you did inspired me to do another thing. People really like that moment of recognition, which um, sometimes when you talk about this, it sounds a bit kind of needy, like people are looking for this kind of approval from other people, um, which you can sort of make sound a bit bad. But I don't think it is bad. I think it's perfectly natural and part of human life that we would seek that from other people, and it's nice to experience that. It's not a needy or, or weak kind of position to be in, it's just nice to be appreciated by other people. Um, so giving people chances, opportunities within these kind of environments to recognize the contribution of others is nice. Um, linking together online and offline, rather obviously, is a nice thing to do. The thing that I like to use as a metaphor for this, purely for personal reasons and not because it's got any interest to anybody else, is uh, this. Um, because I think maybe no, nobody cares about my story about Finn and the coins, which I'm going to tell you. Uh, nobody cares about the story that I'm about to tell you, but maybe it works as, as a, some kind of metaphor for how we can weave together online and offline, just because it was a nice thing that happened. And anything that I can illustrate in a talk with a tweet is good value for me. Uh, and this has got Finn in it. Finn's my son. He's now eight. Um, we've also got Edie, age four. She doesn't feature in any anecdotes during this talk, but I'll make up for that at some other point in her life. She's not going to know. Um, so here we go. This was, um, how does the story go? The story goes, um, I'm in my house. It's about 7.30 in the morning. Finn comes downstairs and says, uh, have we got any of those foreign coins that you always find when you're looking for socks? And we go, oh, well, you always find those foreign coins when you're looking for socks, so let's just go and look in some drawers. We look in the drawers. What we find in the drawers is socks, 
uh, and not the foreign coins that you normally always find when you're looking for socks. So that was disappointing. Um, so Finn wanted to see some foreign coins. Foreign coins, interesting thing. When you ate all those coins from different countries, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we couldn't find one in the house. I said, it's okay, I'm seeing my Creative Encounters students this afternoon. That's a module that I teach at the University of Westminster. Um, so I'll just go on the email thing and send them all an email and ask them if they could bring in any coins. I did, as a parent, if anybody's a parent here, you'll know you need to manage expectations very carefully. I said, this probably won't work. They won't bring any coins. But they might. You can already see from up here. You can see how this story is going to go. So ignore that. Um, so that was that. So I sent out this message. And then I went along to university. And we started the class. And I said, oh, did anybody get the message about the coins? And they all piled in lots and lots of coins. This was, this was the start of it. There's actually a few more arrived a bit later on as well. Um, and so lots of coins, many different coins, coins with wobbly edges, coins in different colors, coins with a different colored circle in the middle to the outer circle. Fascinating these coins are when you're eight. And I, I like them too. It was nice to see the coins. Um, so then, uh, one thing is I take a picture of the coins because I'm pleased that this has happened and I tweet about that. Also, I obviously take the coins home to Finn. Finn's pleased to get the coins. Finn writes them a thank you letter. So there's the thank you letter. Dear students, thank you for all the coins. It was very kind. Love from Finn. Kiss, kiss, kiss. He was only seven when he wrote this. Isn't that nice handwriting? Yes. See, I, I told you this was of no interest to you, but it's heartwarming for me. Um, so there's that bit. And so then I tweet that as well along with that. And so then uh, other people like this thing and it was heartwarming for the entire world. Um, this is a weaving together of, of offline and online things. So you've got the bit where you've got the clearly offline bit where we're hunting through drawers for coins. You've got the more digital bit where I have to communicate with some students to ask them to bring in coins. Then we're back in the offline world where we actually get the coins. Then we have an online bit where I tweet about it. Then we have an offline bit where I take it back to Finn. Finn's pleased. He creates a message that's written on paper. That's still an offline bit. But then I tweet about it, which is an online bit. And then, uh, then other people like that online and share that bit as well. So that's another online bit. So various online and offline bits all woven together nicely. This isn't necessarily a model for how things should be done because it's still a bit too ch 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 switching between one and the other. But maybe it works as some kind of metaphor for somebody who I haven't met yet, but it gave me a chance to tell that story about the coins. Um, the other thing is small steps. I think it's really important to be able to give people small steps into a world of creativity. So if you make it essentially easy for people to take little steps and to value the little steps, that's really important. Because there's a lot of people in the world, it's easy to forget how many, who um, essentially go, oh, I'm not creative, or oh, I couldn't do that thing. Or you set them up with any kind of creative challenge, they're like, oh, I, I couldn't be doing that, I'm not creative. Mr. <coughs> told me at school that I'm not creative. And they always remember that Mr. <coughs> told them at school that they're not creative, so they think they're not creative. Um, so you need to make it really easy for people to step into a sort of creative challenge so that they can then participate and then maybe unlock a whole world of other things they could be doing. I should probably be speeding up. Um, it gets quicker from here, don't worry. Uh, ultimately, to boil all of that stuff down, it's about conversations, which is about people communicating. Inspirations, which is, people don't talk about inspiration enough, I think, that really important moment where somebody inspires somebody else, I think that's a really key bit. Uh, and making things happen. That links up with a blog post which I wrote, which is about, uh, uh, in all of these things I like to talk about, it's Ultimately, essentially, to boil it down to just two words about people making meaningful connections. That's three words, okay. Uh, people making meaningful connections, enabling people to make connections between things, which means that they're forming that meaning themselves in their own minds, which is really powerful, not just you telling them that something is to do with something else. They form that meaning in their own minds, and then it becomes kind of personal and real for them. And links to this bit, which I like this bit. Um, this is a quote from Kevin Kelly. He was the editor of Wired in the past, you know, Wired magazine. Um, and this is a quote which he first said this in like 2008. He says it in another video you can find online it's in 2010. I only encountered this recently, but I like this as a thing to think about. So he says, the internet is this huge copying machine. That's what it does. That is what it does. The internet just copies data from one place to another place. That's just what it does. How do you create things of value if anything can be copied indiscriminately? So of course, this is about the kind of world we live in where any kind of digital thing, if you design products, students, you're right, if you're making physical things that's harder to copy in various different ways. Um, if you're in a world of things like music and writing, for example, it's so, you know, that stuff just flows around the internet completely freely, essentially. Once it's out there, then it's out there. And if you're somebody that wants to be able to uh, make any money value from these things, perhaps then, um, how do you do it? The answer is that 
things that become valuable are the things that cannot be copied. So it's interesting to think about those things which you could never really download because they're essentially about experiences. You can have things, it's not just offline stuff then, because it can be online stuff. You can have experiences where you connect people online and that is unique because it's live, essentially. Um, and so it's not something you could simply download from the internet. But thinking about the ways in which you can create things that can't just be copied and shared around like that and therefore are of value, I think it's an interesting way to put it. And he's put it very nicely in a small number of words there. Um, that's a thing to think about. And also, a thing that I still think is interesting is the long tail, essentially. You know the idea of the long tail, where in the past you had super hit products, which are the ones that you'd have up here. So that's level of popularity or success, and this is stuff. And the long tail just goes along with stuff, 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 and it's what the internet delivers to us these days, because you can have endless amounts of stuff, um, which doesn't have to be especially popular with everybody, but we can still access it very easily. In the past, when stuff, you could only get stuff in shops or libraries and stuff, things with shelves, then you could only really access the top end of the stuff. And now, this is a well-known thing I know, so you've probably heard about it, the long tail gives you all of that stuff. I think the point, the most interesting point about the long tail is just about having a massive range of fascinating things. And we now live in a world with a massive range of fascinating things, much more than 20 or 30 years ago. Um, maybe that makes a bigger impact on you when you're like over 40 like me than it does to those of you who just assume this world of amazing things because it's what you grew up with. But um, the other bit about it, I suppose, is that those things don't need to be polished and we can value those things that are not polished. So in the past, it was all about polished stuff because it had always gone through lots of production processes and editors and publishers and all that kind of thing. I think we're lucky to live in a world where now there's just a lot of unpolished stuff, people just putting out things out there experimentally, essentially. And, and just mucking about, I think it's a much better condition to be in. I'll move on because there's more things to do. But we've only got this collaborations bit, then we've got your platform 22. I'm conscious of people leaving the room whilst I'm talking. It's <laughs> basically why I'm trying to hedge around this whole thing. Um, so in terms of collaborations that I've done, which uh, Rob invited me to say some things about, so I'll say a little bit about each. Um, there's some organisations that I've collaborated with, um, but the most enduring one has been the Lego one. So one thing was, and you can ask me about this if we do questions, we will do questions, you can ask me about this if you're interested. Um, the first thing I connected with Lego with was uh, the thing called Lego Series Play. Who knows what Lego Series Play is? <laughs> John will show at the front, doesn't the rest of you don't. Um, so that's good, because then I can tell you. Uh, Lego Series Play, as a, as a sort of branded term, is a thing that was invented by Lego in sort of the early, the late 90s, early 2000s, as a essentially a workshop consultancy kind of process for adults uh, to be done with businesses and organisations to help them think through strategy and to help build links between different people who work together in an organisation. Um, and within LEGO Series Play, well then what you do is you build experiences in LEGO using metaphors which is a weird thing to say. And it's one of those things where if you just say it, well then people don't really get what it is and you have to actually do it. But you take people through a, a series of exercises where they get used to building in Lego and then get used to thinking about metaphors and building things in metaphors and reminding people that metaphors are actually things that we use in everyday speech all the time. It's nothing uh, unusual in that sense. Um, and so for example, you take them through a step where you might build the boss from hell or the romantic partner from hell and you put in different things in that. So the boss from hell typically is like up on top of a pole, i.e. hundreds of miles away from everybody else. They're normally in some kind of black box, normally fixed, rigidly looking in one direction. Uh, often uh, the, the stuff about lack of communication. I remember one where there was a ladder which went up to the guy. It's normally a guy, guy in the black box. But the ladder could be kicked away at any time whenever he was in a bad mood or didn't want to talk to anybody. Those kind of fixed, rigid, dark, grumpy kind of things. And then when you've gone through that kind of stage, well then, uh, people are able to do something much more positive or something about themselves. So, I worked with Lego on this in the past and I used it as a social science kind of research tool, getting people to build metaphorical models of their identity in Lego. Which again, is something where if you say to people, hi, we're going to build metaphorical models of our identity in Lego, then people are just like, whoa, what, eh? But if you take them through a series of steps, then they can do that. And I found that um, a wide range of people from many different demographic backgrounds uh, could all do it and ended up building models of themselves, but not looking like themselves. It's a metaphorical model of all sorts of different aspects of their identity. Um, so that was, that was very interesting to do. Um, and it's about using physical products to build things, connect things together, forming ideas, 
finding some way of externalizing your own experiences. In terms of having lots of people in a, in a team, for example, doing this, it's really nice because it means that everybody creates something and puts it on the table and it becomes part of the thing you're working with. So if you've got different team members uh, who all contribute to some kind of ongoing enterprise, they've all built like what they do and then you put it all together and you look for the connections and you've got this thing in front of you so you can look for like, well, why is that thing nowhere near that thing? And I thought that thing would be connected to that, but it's nowhere near. Or other things that are sort of surprisingly similar that you can connect up. You've got this physical thing to work with and everybody has a voice because they all created a thing and it's all part of the thing that you're talking about. So it's not like those meetings where, you know, there's normally somebody who talks quite a lot and there's normally some people who don't talk very much at all. Um, because everybody's created a physical thing, it's just there and it's and you remember the story that people have told about it because it's a physical thing. So there's something very interesting about the, the thinginess of the project, the, the actual products that people have made, where you remember the story they've told because it's this personal thing that contains these personal details. They tell you about all the different things that are within it. Um, and it seemed like a really powerful process. So one thing I did with LEGO was that, working on LEGO Series Play. Then. Um, I became part of the thing called the Lego Learning Institute where we did lots of different things which at one point they put together on a wall chart which now I stuck up here to show all the different things we did. But we essentially did reports about creativity and play and learning and called things like the future of learning and the future of play. Um, so that was a string of different stuff. And then that became part of the Lego Foundation. The Lego Learning Institute became part of the Lego Foundation. Uh, the Lego Foundation owns a quarter of the Lego company, which these days means it's extremely wealthy because uh, Lego is doing incredibly well, as you may or may not know. Um, Lego had a bit of a downturn in the about 10 years ago or more. Um, but ever since like, we started having that recession around 2008 and all of that bad stuff financially, turns out people still really want to buy Lego and Lego has gone done really well. Uh, also because the products are better now and they stopped doing some stupid stuff that they were doing and focused more on the essential idea of the brick. Um, so that's a, a nice model that we created about culture and how making, you've got these different elements, having, doing, being and knowing, these are the different elements of a culture. And if you've got a creative culture, it has these different parts to it. Um, and these are the different sort of areas which are then connected by activities. The activities are making, sharing, playing, and thinking. Um, that's just going to flash past while I move on to something else, but that might be worth looking at if you're interested. Another thing when you work with LEGO is that you can always just talk about the LEGO stuff with the LEGO people. And so I can talk endlessly, literally, <laughs> uh, about things like LEGO Friends. Uh, if we had a spare three weeks, we could just debate LEGO Friends forever. Um, and in terms of Platform 22, which we're coming to in a moment about morals, consumerism, those kind of ethics, those kind of questions. Um, I, I don't think this is an immobile product. I think this is a nice product. In fact, this particular one, uh, that's Olivia's Treehouse, I believe. I bought that for Finn when he was about four, um, which seemed good because he was a boy. So no, nobody could accuse you of gender stereotyping because it's, it's a nice construction. It's a construction toy. It's more made of actual Lego. So all the Lego friends stuff is made of actual Lego. So if you think the construction toys are a good thing, and getting girls into construction toys is a good thing, which we probably do all agree on, then, uh, then Lego Friends should be good, but then everybody goes, yeah, but it's got pink in it. And then you get to the whole question of, yeah, but that's a color. How can you say that? Is a color sexist? Is pink a bad thing? I like pink. <laughs> How could you know, I talk endlessly about the color pink uh, and, and why it may or may not be wrong? And then you've also got arguments to be had about the different kind of products that they make, which include things like uh, um, you know, Emma's Science Lab, as well as, uh, you know, Claire's hairdressing salon. I tend to mention more often the science lab and the design workshop and those kind of things. Now people go, yeah, but she's a, fi she's a fashion designer. That's sexist. It's like, yeah, but being a fashion designer is an actual job. This can go on forever, these kind of things. Being a fashion designer is a professional job for people to have. That's not a bad thing. Or is it a bad thing because it's for girls? Uh, okay. Uh, platform 22. So, design product students, you wanted to talk about Platform 22. So I was invited to say something about this, so I will, but then I'm interested to see what you think about it. So who wrote this? Is the person who wrote this in the room? Or any number of you that wrote this? Was this written by students? Yeah. yeah. You, together you wrote this? Is that right? No. You're all like, half of you are fleeing the room, and the other half are like, no, it's nothing to do with us, we don't know. But um, it, it's this anyway, so I'll... I'll I'll just pretend I found this. You don't need to say who's responsible for it. Um, it was an interesting thing to have to respond to. Um, it, it, it's written in, 
essentially an angry style, which I like because it means you're trying to provoke something. Um, it may be slightly contradictory, um, but that's good too. Um, so it says, the mobilistic high road that leads to shattered dreams. I think the mobilistic high road is, uh, I think that refers to like the desire to do good stuff in the world and the shattered dreams are being crushed under the wheels of evil capitalism. I think that's the, the gist of it. Um, it says here, with lots of fascinating words, integrity, moral courage, capitalist ruling, fetishistic, cornucopia of pointless product, social conditioning. And that's just an introduction. Um, so, this bit, right? So, our designers, I'm reminding you of it now because you don't seem to be deeply familiar with it. Uh, no one's quite sure where it came from, as far as I can tell. Uh, our designers, puppets of a larger system, that at the same time feeds us and yet fucks us over constantly. Um, I, I get the hint from that sentence that the answer is believed to be yes, that is the case. We're caught up in a vast and vicious economic system that can force us to sacrifice our values as designers. Our aim is to discuss if this is avoidable in the future um, by the application of moral courage, where moral courage is a good thing, and whether design principles even matter anyway, which seems like a sudden sort of miserable bit thrown onto the end of what could have been a potentially quite positive sentence. Um, I, the simple answer to this is, if you're asking me, which apparently you are <laughs> in this case, uh, yes, it is avoidable, uh, and you do need to apply the moral courage. Um, it is also the case, you must know from like the various design studios that you look up to and things, that there's examples of people who are really aspiring to do good and innovative things, and to make things better in the world, who are successful. You know, IDEO, Thomas Heatherwick, people like that, they're, um, they're doing really interesting stuff, and they do have an aspiration to be sort of making stuff better in the world, don't they? And I think it's fair to say that they are. Um, I'm, my brain is being vaguely troubled by something negative about Thomas Heatherwick, but I can't remember what it was now. But something, somebody pointed out that he was horribly... What? Bridge. The Garden Bridge. The Garden Bridge. That's all to do with politics and Boris and stuff, though, isn't it? The basic idea of the pretty bridge is still, it's still a very pretty bridge. <laughs> uh, whether that's all... The, yeah, OK, we're not going to get into the whole Garden Bridge thing. If you want to look up what the Garden Bridge controversy is, if you haven't got, a talk, or haven't got any idea what we're talking about, look that up on the Google. Um, I think there are people who aspire to be doing interesting stuff though and aspire to be doing it in an essentially an ethical kind of way. Uh, give or take planning regulations. Um, it says here, we want to explore the relationship between honest design, um, all, all the positive words have been crossed out for some reason. <laughs> honest design, namely upholding moral values and success in the consumerist dog eat dog society we live in. Do you have to fuck people over to be successful and influential? Sure, I think not. There are some people who um, obviously do this, and there's always endless anecdotes about um, essentially people fucking other people over in order to be successful. You do get those, and they become memorable stories. But the fact they become memorable stories probably goes to show that it's not what's always happening. Otherwise, it'd just be so normal we wouldn't be sharing those stories. Um, is it possible to run an honest business and still become authoritative leaders? It's obviously a challenge. <laughs> that is true. It says here, on the one hand, we want to investigate whether moral values can be embedded and communicated to objects. So I'd like to hear from you whether you've managed that. And if this affects the role of the designer in the future. On the other hand, we will discuss whether designers can be leaders in shaping more ethical businesses. Surely you think, design product students, that designers can be leaders in shaping more ethical businesses. So thankfully that one answers itself. Um, and you do get examples, don't you, of people who are working, inevitably you're kind of compromised. If you're working within some kind of capitalist thing, if you're running a business, there's some level of compromise. You do need to be making money and so on. And then within that, you're struggling to sort of do the best you can in order to be ethical and to not destroy the environment, all those kind of things. There's always a tension. But I think uh, clearly people do strive to do that. And I think some people do it reasonably well. It says here, some of effort, I'm just making sure we've gone through it because I've got a contractual responsibility to talk about this. Uh, some of our references and discussion points include uh, beyond the search and uh, beyond the new search for ideals. Hopefully, you've read that. <laughs> IKEA's business model, which in the past would always have seemed like a surprising thing to have on this list, but maybe we're getting our heads around that. Um, and that quote from Philippe Stark Today, we see very talented, intelligent designers who use their skills to create useless stuff, which are developed not to help people, but just to make money, essentially. Um, and then again, we can immediately launch back into the whole debate about Lego and Lego friends and should you be making more bricks in the world and whether these things are sexist products or whether it's really good because you're getting people to make stuff with their hands and encouraging them to be creative, for example. Um, my thoughts about this were, 
Essentially, I fucked him over here. Um, I was asked to comment on this, so don't blame me. Uh, my thoughts were this. In terms of a moral purpose for designers, and this is where we think of moral purpose in, in the good kind of sense, it's easy to think of like moralism as a bad thing. But if we're talking about the strong moral purpose for designers, I think essentially designers do have a strong moral purpose to make stuff that's better for people. And within that, it includes an expectation that you are going to be essentially ethical, do things that are good for the environment, rather than really, really bad for the environment, or at least try to steer in that direction. And not to just be making products for the sake of it, but make products that enrich people's lives in meaningful ways. But you surely all aspire to that, don't you? You don't get to be a MA design product student at the Royal College of Art just because you want to churn out some bits of plastic crap to put in crackers or something. It's probably because you want to be doing something meaningful for people. Somebody did a, I'm not sure about that kind of head expression there, I'm not sure. Um, I think you probably want to be doing something good that makes an impact on people, don't you? That seems likely to me. I'm going to invite you to comment in a minute. Um, optimism versus pessimism. Uh, what I mean by that is, within this document, there's bits of optimism and there's bits of pessimism. What I always think about this is, there's just no point being pessimistic because people who are just pessimistic and signed up to pessimism are not going to be able to give you any kind of solutions to anything. So what's the point? I mean, in a sense, going back to the moral's tone, we've got a strong moralistic tone over here. It is, it's morally wrong to sign up to pure pessimism because then you've got nothing. You haven't got any hope. So you have to try to be in some way optimistic and think what are the best ways in which we can do design so it will have a positive effect and think that we can do that. If you just resign yourself to the idea that you can't do that, we just live in a fucked up world with fucked up products and uh, it's all a waste of time, then, ugh, okay, you know, fine, go off and sit in some miserable room and be miserable. But if you're not that person, then good. <laughs> because I think you have to seize the opportunity to try to make things better and not give up on that possibility. Because what else can you do? That'd just be hopeless. Um, designers are needed to advance this particular fight. Um, all the stuff it's talking about there, the, the screwed up nature of capitalism and the way in which it seems to include this kind of drive to be creating products that nobody really wants, but hopefully we can try and persuade them that they do want it. Um, you need designers to be on the front line of that, making sure that we are creating things that people actually want. And maybe helping them to be aware of the need for things that are actually useful or helping them to connect with things that are meaningful, but not just creating crap for the sake of it. I'm sure we all agree on that because nobody's going to stand up and say, oh, I really like creating crap for the sake of it. Unless you do. Oh, and last one. Uh, so this is my brief response to Platform 22. I say yes to the critical gist of it, um, uh, but I say no to the gloomy spirit which seems to come across <laughs> at certain points. Um, and that's not just to be argumentative or something. I think it's important to stick with the optimism that we can change things, we can make things better. That is your role as designers to lead that, that drive towards that better world, essentially. Um, that's what you're here for. So that's all I've got to say. <laughs>